good morning. Welcome to worship with the people of Phillips United Methodist Church of Lakewood, Colorado. I'm Pastor Joyce de Tony Hill, welcoming you to the worship on the third Sunday of the beautiful season of Epiphany. Epiphany is a time of revelation, of new insights, new opportunities. It is that time when we continue to journey on and follow the star to see where its path leads. On today, we will see the path leads to Jesus Christ, who proclaims that the kingdom of God is at hand, and he invites every one of us to be a part of it. As he invites you to follow, how will you reply? Will you follow? Will you say yes to God's yes for you? Let us worship God. Good morning, Phillips family. Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus is here calling us to be his disciples. Jesus is here calling us to leave our nets. Jesus is inviting us to fish for God's children. Will you follow the Lord of life? Craig Tershi, and this is the children's message. Now, throughout the Bible, God has called people to service. And throughout the Bible, sometimes they listen and obey, and sometimes not. And that's pretty much the same things work today. How many times have you been asked to do something and have found an excuse not to do it? So one of the most famous shirkers in the Bible was a man named Jonah. But Jonah was called by God to go and preach to the Ninevites. And God didn't want him to tell the Ninevites that doing, they were doing a great job. He had to tell them that they were messing up. And so, as you might expect, Jonah didn't really want to do that. So God asks Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah hops on a boat and decides to go in the exact opposite direction. Well, many of you know how this story turns out. The boat ends up in a big storm that God has created. And the people on the boat, the sailors are working to save the boat, but everything they do seems to not work. And Jonah realizes that this is God being angry with him for not doing as he was asked. So he tells the people on the boat that they should just toss him into the sea and everything will be okay. They think that's kind of a daft idea and they don't do it at first, but eventually they succumb and they do throw Jonah into the sea and the sea is calmed immediately. Now, Jonah, on the other hand, is swallowed up by a fish, and he lives in that fish, according to the Bible, for three days before the fish returns him to land and spits him back up on shore. Now, the next time Jonah is asked by God to do something, he does it, and he goes to Nineveh and preaches, as he was told. Now, the second story in the Bible comes from the first chapter of the book of Mark in the New Testament. In this story, Jesus is walking along the beach and he sees Simon and Andrew fishing. And he says, hey, drop those nets and follow me. And the amazing thing is they do just that. They drop their nets and they follow Jesus. Now that seems pretty amazing. I mean, these are two hardworking fishermen. They're doing the job that 
That's the way they earn their living. It's what they've been doing all their life. And yet they just drop their nets and follow Jesus. Well, it turns out there's a little more to the story than Mark tells us. You see, elsewhere in the Bible, it explains that Jesus has been known to Andrew and Simon for some time. In fact, he's been preaching in Galilee, and so they probably know him and realize that he's a great prophet. So you see, God didn't just expect them to blindly follow Jesus. They prepared them. He gave them some teaching, some lessons to help them realize that they should follow Jesus. Now, in our case, I think we're more like the New Testament than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God used a big fish to convince Jonah to do what he was asked. In the New Testament, God uses a more subtle approach. He helps prepare people to be able to welcome Jesus and follow him. I think we're like those New Testament followers. You see, we've been to church and to Sunday school, and we know that Jesus loves us, and he loves the world that we live in. And we know that Jesus calls on us to follow his teachings. So I hope that we're ready to answer, yes, I will, when we hear Jesus call. When he calls on us to help our neighbors or to speak the truth or to share some of our blessings or to fight for justice. And just remember, if you don't listen when Jesus calls, God still has that big fish out there if necessary. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Jesus, when you call for us to follow you, help us to say yes and not just give excuses. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So nice to have you with us. We have a sense of hope and uh, expectation as we come into this week. Now that we know the vaccine is starting to be available to people and we have a new president as of today, uh, we're taping this on inaugural day, who might give new ideas and new inspirations to our nation. So that's good news for all of us to have some good things happening within our nation after some very difficult two weeks prior to this. I only have a couple of prayer concerns at this time. First of all, I want to ask for prayers for Gordon and Cheryl. You might remember last week that their daughter-in-law, Jenna, had lost her father to COVID. And now this week, their other daughter-in-law, Kim, that is married to Roger, lost her mother to COVID. So we certainly want to hold that family in our prayers. Uh, it's always extra hard to hear that it's some of your close relatives and friends who have passed away. Second item is simply that uh, Frank, after his bad fall and time over at St. Joe's Hospital, is now at the Sloan's Lake Rehab Center up there by Sloan's Lake. And we will be giving you the address if you want to call, call me, uh, I can tell you the address. So first of all, we're just going to have a silent prayer. Then we'll have a community prayer. So let us bow in prayer. Amen. Lord God, we come to you on this day, opening up our hearts to listen to your word for us and being aware of many, many difficult situations among our neighbors and friends and across this entire nation. We come with a sense of hope for the future, but yet we're very aware of all of those who have uh, experienced uh, the pandemic and are struggling and some of their relatives are dying. We're aware of fires and wind and snow, fires in our west coast and the east coast with bad weather. All of those things are heavy on our hearts and we're grateful for your presence with us always. You call us. We are wanderers of the seashores and the sidewalks. You invite us to sail out 
of our smug harbors into the uncharted waters of faith to wander off from our predictable paths to follow you into the unpredictable footsteps of the kingdom to leave the comfort of our homes and accompany you into the uncomfortable neighborhood that we usually avoid as we wait in our simple sometimes crazy constantly uncertain lives speak to us spirit of grace of that hope which is our anchor of that peace which is our rock of that grace which is our refuge we thank you especially among all of the love and grace and forgiveness and guidance and care that you give us we especially thank you for the gift of your son Jesus the Christ who has showed us how to live and love and be how to know you better and have know each other better we pray together now the prayer he taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen the time of our offering every week is that time when we celebrate the opportunity to give ourselves to the world as we give ourselves to god this week in our expanding the witness moment i want to let you know that uh, we'll have an opportunity to expand our witness by growing in our own faith it's really hard to believe that lent is fast approaching Ash Wednesday begins a month from now on February 17th. That will be Ash Wednesday. And then, of course, the 40 days of Lent. During our drive through communion on the first Sunday of February at 10 o'clock uh, next month, every one of you will be receiving a Lenten prayer kit. And this little kit is going to provide ashes, but it will also provide some tools for you to grow in your faith during the season of Lent. So I wanted to let you know about that ahead of time. I hope to see you at drive Through Communion on the first Sunday of February. And uh, I'll be also sharing with you a little bit as well, a little bit later on, how you may also get the kit if you're not able to come on that day. But what an oppor opportunity to grow in our faith as we offer our prayers, our gifts, our service. Thanks be to God. God of abundance, you teach us the dangers of setting our hearts on earthly riches. May our offerings be symbols of our faith in your abundance and our commitment to follow your call in our lives. Amen. The scripture from this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter one, verses 14 through 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching for the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. I am going on and going on a little farther, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were in the boat mending their nets, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed them. God bless this reading. Thank you to Bo for reading our gospel lesson. And now we will hear the Old Testament lesson for today. It is the story of Jonah, chapter 3, 1 through 5, and then verse 10. And it starts at a rather interesting place. It starts in the beginning of, or in the middle of the story, which I will also explain a little bit uh, later in the message. So the word of the Lord 
came to Jonah a second time. And God said, get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, the three days walk across. And Jonah began to get to go into the city, and he cried out, In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast. And everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. For morning. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God said he would bring upon them, and God did not do it. The word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to hear the word proclaimed, let us pray. O oh God, we are here, and help us to hear the word of God as those for whom the kingdom has drawn near. Amen. Today is the third Sunday of the beautiful season of Epiphany, and I appreciate the poetic words of spiritual director Ruth Haley Barton as she describes the beauty of Epiphany. I want to share her words with you. Epiphany begins the day when Christians celebrate the journey of the wise men to find the Christ child and the showing forth of God's glory in such an unexpected place. The arrival of the wise men in Bethlehem and the homage they paid when they found Jesus in the manger is the culminating event of our Christmas season their willingness to leave the familiar and embark on such a perilous journey invites us to our own journey of finding and encountering God in unlikely ways and unlikely places. The journey of the wise men speak to us of those moments when we are not satisfied to hear other people's reports of mysterious revelations. Yes, we have heard the good news that Christ has come into the world, but hearsay is not enough because we want to see, we want to experience this Christ for ourselves. This desire can, if we let it, open up to a new kind of journey, one that is alive with the possibilities of encountering the mystery of Christ in all the unlikely places of our own lives. We too can make choices to leave the familiar and follow the light that is rising into our own hearts, leading us to that place of great joy. I want to also share a beautiful poem. It's called Beckoning God by Kate, by Kate Compston. It also reminds us of the beauty of Epiphany. And this poem is a prayer, really. Beckoning God, who called the rich to travel towards poverty, the wise to embrace your folly, the powerful to know their own frailty, who gave strangers the sense of homecoming in an alien land, and to stargazers true light and vision as they bowed to earth, we lay ourselves open to the, your signs for us. Rise within us like a star and make us restless until we journey forth to seek our rest in you. That is the end of her poem. It says a lot. And it intrigues me to ask the question, how often do we really lay ourselves open to God's signs for us? So by an at-home show of hands, 
I'm going to ask you how many of you have ever prayed to God and asked God to show you a directional sign. I know I have. Have you said to God, God, if you could just show me the sign and I'll go. I'll do whatever it is that you ask of me and I will follow where you lead, God. But then how often do we follow through and actually lay ourselves open to receiving the signs? And once we receive the signs, we follow the direction. Do we actually go that far beyond the lip service? Now, for those of you who are wondering how to discern a sign of God, I'm going to tell you a little secret, and here it is. The sign of God is that we are led to places we had not planned to go. The sign of God is that we are led to places we would never plan to go. And those places, if we know God well, are going to be the difficult places, the unwanted places, the challenging places, the uncomfortable places, those that are bigger and wider than we could ever imagine. They will be unknown places. But nevertheless, if we know Jesus in faith well, we will know that those places are going to lead us to our own resurrection. So if God, and that is if God can get our attention in the first place, how many times have we walked by the burning bush and not even notice it? I think God is always trying to get our attention. Today's two epiphany story, open our eyes to the ways that God tends to beckon and invite us and then sends us places that we have not gone before and would never think to go on our own. And no one knows that more than Jonah, the reluctant prophet. Now, we tell the story of Jonah in a whale because that's kind of, oh, that's fun to tell for children. And it's, it's, it's at a child's level that we can grasp. But oftentimes we don't go any farther than the child's understanding of a great story. So let's back up a little bit and understand the, the big picture of the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of Israel in the 8th century BC. It was a time when the small country of Israel was overshadowed by all the superpowers of Babylon, due east, and then there was the greatest superpower of them all, the Assyrians. And Nineveh was the grand capital city of Assyria, which uh, was now the, near the modern city of Mosul. It was home to 100,000 residents. And God approached Jonah with a great assignment to call the Ninevites to repent of their evil ways and to return to the love of God and to neighbor. It sounds good. And who would argue with that? Well, Jonah. The conversation between Jonah and God went something like this. God says, Jonah, I want you to travel to Nineveh, to the people of this capital city, and deliver the word of conviction and give them the opportunity to repent and come to me. Well, Jonah is incredulous and replies to God saying, have you forgotten the Assyrians are our enemy? Have you forgotten, God, how they attacked Israel's cities, how they massacred so many hundreds and hundreds of our people and then stole away the rest into exile? And God's reply went something like this. Well, yes, of course I do. And yes, this is a tough assignment and that is exactly why I chose you. Jonah, you're my A-team. You know me so well and you know me enough to speak for me. Your words and the way you tell them are powerful so that when you speak, people will listen. 
And that's why you are the very best person for this huge, difficult job. Well, Jonah replies something like this. But God, if I do this, they're going to repent. And then you are going to shower them with grace. And God replies, so, huh? And you have a power, a problem with that? Jonah did have a problem with that. And he said, no. He knew full well that this was the word of God for him because God was sending to him to a place he would never choose to go on his own. It was to a place that was very far away. He'd probably not been there before and he didn't know where to go. And it was to a people that he feared, a place that he hated. And the, and this is, a supposed, this is supposed to be a very funny story because it is so human. And as if Jonah thought he could possibly outrun God, he takes a boat in the opposite direction on the Mediterranean Sea. But God knows the best candidate. And so God churns up a great storm at sea and Jonah is tossed overboard and then he is swallowed up by that large fish that God commissions and turns him around and delivers Jonah directly back to shore and burps him right back up to the starting place. And that is where we began the Old Testament story today, in the middle of the story. And the word of God came to Jonah the second time. Why the second time? Well, the first time didn't go so well, did it? And maybe he needed a little bit of time out to really think about what was before him. But this time with the second ask, Jonah decided he would, better, he would be better off to go into the direction of, that the word of God pointed. And when he got there, I just used my imagination. I wonder, no one really knows his attitude on the day that he preached to Nineveh. Maybe he was kind of limp about it. Maybe a little lackluster. Maybe he gave it his everything. We don't know. But when he told them the eight words that basically said, if you didn't turn away from your bloodthirsty ways, God is going to overthrow your mighty nation, you will no longer be number one. Well, Jonah indeed was that A team. And not only did the populace uh, repent, but the government repented. And it said even the animals, all of creation in that city repented and turned to God. Once again, the sign of God was that Jonah was sent to a place that he had never intended to go. And he didn't want this reconciliation. That was never Jonah's plan at all. But in Jonah's pain, he couldn't see the big picture. He couldn't understand that the big picture that God was reconciling all of God's creation back to God. Division and pain and torture and brokenness and war was not in God's original creation. But rather, God yearned for that beloved community that God had created and said, this is good. And Jonah's vision was way too small. The sign of God is that we are sent to places we would never plan to go. This week we celebrated, in a very different way, Martin Luther King Day. And oh, we so need the prophets to take us to the mountaintops to behold the grand scope of God's beloved landscape. We need to go with those prophets to see for ourselves the widest boundaries of God's mercy, grace, and justice. We need, when we get up to that top, we need to recognize the others who are with us, alongside, peering into the possibilities before us, opening our eyes to new visions for hope when we take 
the initiative to work together for us, for it. Reverend France Davis of Salt Lake City's Calvary Baptist Church was one who knew Dr. King back in the day. And Pastor Davis, in a, um, an article, explained why he places portraits and pictures of Dr. King in the church's main meeting room where all kinds of decisions and prayer groups are meeting. He said they remind church members to dream the biggest dreams for the future, presenting Reverend King as a symbol of what is possible when we put our faith into full action. Now, we still have a long way to go. This is not easy work. Creating community is terribly difficult. It is long-term. It is diligent and even very courageous work. And really, it's, it's not someplace we would actually plan to go. It's the prophets like King and Mandela who remind us that it is courage that allows us to move through this in spite of our fears. In Dr. Martin Luther King's Jr.'s autobiography, he talks to us about courage and what it does for us. He says, courage is an inner resolution to go forward despite those obstacles. Cowardice is the submissive surrender to circumstances. Courage breeds creativity. Cowardice represses fear and is mastered by it. Cowardice asks the question, Huh, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular or what's in it for me? But conscience asks the question, is it the right thing to do? And there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe nor politic or popular but one that we must take because it is right. The call of Jesus is always before us. Jesus called Simon, Andrew, James, and John to shift or pivot to a path that they certainly did not plan to go. They dropped their nets, they ventured forth into the unknown, left their families, and then with the advantage of the Gospels, we have the ability to see how that decision to accept the risk Jesus presented, how it changed their hearts and it changed the world. And Jesus' call continues through space and time. This week, President Biden offered us a view of the landscape that is now before us as a country. He mentioned there's a pandemic and there's physical, mental, and spiritual healing before us in the nation. And he said these words, this is a great nation. We are a good people. And over the centuries through storm and strife, peace and in war, we have come so far, but we still have far to go. We'll press forward with speed and urgency, for we have much to do in the winter of this peril and significant possibilities. Much to repair, much to restore, much to heal, much to build, and much to gain. Uniting the fight the, uh, to fight the foes that we face, which include anger and resentment and hatred and extremism and lawlessness and violence and disease and joblessness and hopelessness. But with unity, we can do great things. We can do important things. We can do the right things. We can put people to work in their jobs. We can teach our children in safe schools. We can overcome this deadly virus, and we can reward work and rebuild the middle class and, and make health care secure for everybody. We can deliver racial justice, and we can make America a leading force for good in the world. That's quite a challenge, a challenge that we embark on in love. The book of Jonah 
was written by a very wise person to remind the Hebrew people of who they were, that they were God's children, and so they knew God and God's values, what God was going to be all about. They had a purpose, and God called them to be the light for the world. God equipped them with a faith and God's presence to be able to act this out. And Jonah's story challenged them to claim that call. Methodist Bishop Gerald Kennedy wrote the words to a hymn we have sung many years, God of love and God of power. And in this, he encourages us to embrace Jesus' call for justice and peace and shalom because the kingdom is at hand, as Jesus tells us. God of love and God of power, grant us in this burning hour grace to ask these gifts of these, daring hearts and spirits free. God of love and God of power, you have called us for this hour. We are not the first to be banished by our fears from thee. So give us courage and let us hear heaven's trumpets ringing clear. For God of love and God of power, you have called us for this hour. We have everything that we need, just like Jonah. We know God. We know God's grace. So may we continue to hear and discern God's call in the midst of the many, many opportunities that God places before us. The voice, the word of God is there if we listen for it. So how will we discern which voice to follow? Well, the sign of God is, well, you know. Let us pray. God, teach us anew. You are our rock and our salvation. Teach us how your kingdom has come near. As you called Simon and Andrew long ago, call us to be your disciples this day, that we might find refuge and strength as we face the destructive forces in our lives. Call Grant us the strength to wait for you in silence, that we might meet you in the subterranean chambers of our souls. For in you, we rest secure. In you, we abide in holy love. Amen.
now, people of God, go forth this day, bearing the light of Jesus Christ, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Go sharing the good news, and may God bless us all as we go forth. Amen. As we part for the towns and cities where you summon us to go, guide us, Lord, give us strength.